Hi, everyone. Um, so I thought I'd, I'd start off my talk by reflecting a little bit on uh, why we're all here today, why we took our Monday off to sit and uh, talk about and think about this one relatively small group of fishes, uh, the Salmonids. And I think uh, many of the reasons for that can be encapsulated uh, in this photograph. So um, this is me and my dad and a Chinook salmon that we, well, mostly my dad, caught. Um, and we're quite pleased with ourselves, as you can tell. Uh, and the reason for this is because uh, salmonids are really tasty, and I can vouch for that. Uh, specifically, this individual is very tasty, uh, and that underlies a lot of their value to us. First of all, in terms of their economic value, um, they're the basis of commercially important fisheries, as well as uh, recreational fisheries, like the one me and my dad were participating in. Uh, as well as aquaculture. Now, related to their importance uh, economically is their cultural value. So uh, we caught this Chinook salmon off the west coast of Canada in a place called Haida Gwaii. And uh, recent archaeological evidence suggests that indigenous peoples have been catching and eating salmonids in this region for thousands of years. Uh, and it remains an important part of the culture of many indigenous peoples around the world. Um, and also around the world, uh, salmonids are an important source of uh, protein, rather, for communities where uh, food security is a real issue. Uh, as we saw just from George's talk, um, also salmonids have huge ecological value, right? Because they're tasty not only to us, but to many other species. Um, and in terms of anadromous individuals like this Chinook salmon here, they're an important um, in terms of transporting nutrients between oceanic and terrestrial environments. And I think my favorite demonstration of this was some work um, uh, by Thomas Quinn out of the University of Washington, where they basically went to this one river for 20 years and took all the dead salmon they could find and threw them to one side of the river and then after 20 years, they found that the trees on that side of the river had actually grown taller. Um, so this really indicates the, the, the key role that anadromous salmonids play in the ecosystem. Um, but today I'd like to speak to you about uh, sort of another reason to like salmonids, which is perhaps a little less intuitive than these three uh, reasons, and that is uh, their evolutionary value. And by that, I mean uh, that salmonids offer a really wonderful opportunity to uh, inform us about evolutionary processes. And one of the reasons for this is because salmonids have a lot of what's called sympatric morphs. So these are phenotypically or genetically differentiated groups of intraspecific organisms uh, within cruising distance. So that's Mayer's definition of sympatry. So uh, salmonids, uh, as I mentioned, are famous for this. So here we have five different examples. Uh, so just from a bunch of different species. Um, and I want you to note just how, how beautiful, oops, I want you to notice how beautiful this species is, the Arctic char, uh, in comparison to the grayling we saw earlier. Um, I'll, I'll let you make your own judgments as to what is the more beautiful species. But uh, yeah, so, so it's important to notice that the, the phenotypic differentiation we're observing here is, is not just within species, but it's also within sometimes a very small lake. You get these dramatically differentiated forms. And these are sort of wonderful models for studying speciation because it's sort of like speciation in miniature because uh, all of these morphs have evolved on a relatively short evolutionary time frame because salmonids tend to occupy land that was historically glaciated and so most of the sympatric morphs that we've been studying have evolved within the last 40,000 years or so. And that's important because it means that the genetic signatures of that differentiation have not yet been eroded due to selection or drift. So I was very interested in these sympatric morphs within Salmonidae, so uh, I wrote this uh, I, I conducted this review of the literature with my PhD supervisor, Daniel Rosante. And the first thing that we were interested in was uh, figuring out uh, which Salmonid species had evidence of these sympatric morphs and which had um, 
sort of genetic, strong genetic differentiation between the sympatric morphs, evidence of reproductive isolation. And after consulting hundreds of papers that had sort of assessed the genetic differentiation between the sympatric morphs of, across a wide variety of cell-mounted species, we found that these morphs tended to group into five distinct uh, categories. So the first is sympatric morphs could differ by migratory life history. So a common one is you'll have a freshwater resident co-occurring with an anadromous form, which goes to the ocean. You could also have morphs that differ in terms of where they're spawning, so a different uh, uh, depths within a lake, for example. They could also differ by time, so spring and fall spawners commonly co-occur within cell monads. And also, these morphs can differ in terms of what they look like, how they're behaving, um, and their trophic level within um, the lake. Uh, so there are many examples of this. There are some really interesting ones here in Sweden. So uh, I suspect many of you in the audience will be familiar with this work, uh, particularly our moderator. Um, so southwest of here in Lake Fegan, we have sympatric uh, vendus. You have that differ morphologically, particularly in the eye size, but they also differ in terms of when they're spawning, spring and fall. And based on neutral microsatellite markers, we know that they're uh, strongly genetically differentiated from each other. So you'll notice that uh, I only gave you four types of sympatric morphs here, so there's actually a fifth type, which I think is a very interesting one. So this is where you have uh, fish that look identical to each other, uh, but they show strong genetic differentiation from each other. And these are called cryptic morphs. And this is a more rare uh, type of sympatric morph, but there's also an example of this here in Sweden. It's probably one of the most famous types or the most famous example of sympatric morphs, actually. And this was some um, sort of trailblazing work done in the 1970s uh, that looked at brown trout in a population of Sweden uh, in the Northwest. And at the time, they were using cutting-edge genetic technology, which was uh, allozymes. And what they found was that uh, brown trout in this lake tended to be homozygous for either the A allele or the B allele. And so they proposed that these might be reproductively isolated subpopulations co-occurring in this lake. Um, so again, this was, this was cutting edge work at the time, but we now know that you know, one gene does not necessarily indicate reproductive isolation. And so the authors actually revisited the same population. Uh, there we go. They revisited this population and they sequenced it using pool sequencing. So they're sequencing across the genome. And this is what they found. So um, just to orient you to this type of figure, I'll be showing several of these. So this is a, it's a Manhattan plot because it's supposed to look like the Manhattan skyline. Um, and along the x-axis is the position along the genome, so chromosome number. And the y-axis is FST, which is a measure of genetic differentiation. And so the, the points here are single nucleotide polymorphisms or just, you can think of it as like a position along the genome. And so high values mean strong genetic differences between sympatric morphs. So if there was no genetic differentiation between the two brown trout morphs, we'd see like a line at uh, y equals zero. But you can see that's not what we see. We see lots of peaks, lots of um, regions of the genome that have strong genetic differentiation and indeed, um, this suggests that there is, in fact, reproductive isolation between what are still thought to be uh, cryptic morphs. That's a pretty cool result to see um, all of this pool sequencing, you know, um, reinforcing what was found 40 years ago with allozymes. Okay, so returning to uh, our list of five uh, types of sympatric morphs, uh, it's important to note that these morph types are not mutually exclusive, that sometimes sympatric morphs can fit multiple of these categories. And I also want to note that these morph types are not only found in salmonids, they're found in other species as well, and also the way in which these morphs are differentiated in terms of like isolation by time or isolation by microallopatry. These are um, evolutionary processes that play a role in speciation across the tree of life. So what I'm getting at here is sort of studying these in salmonids can tell us something about speciation more generally. Okay, so if we look at um, over all of well, it's not all of salmonids, but uh, many salmonid species, here's where we see genetically differentiated sympatric morphs in each of the morph types. And what you'll notice is that many species have multiple morph types, and also that 
Uh, in some morph types, we have many salmonid species that have examples of this. So as I mentioned, a sympatric resident in anadromous morph is common in many salmonid species. Uh, and that's useful because it means we can compare like resident anadromous morphs across different salmonid species to see if the genetic underpinnings are similar. But we can also investigate uh, within species and compare uh, resident and anatomist populations within a species. And the reason for this is because we think that these sympatric morphs have evolved um, relatively independently from each other in most instances, um, and also repeatedly. And so this is reflected in how they relate genetically to each other, such that sympatric morphs tend to be more closely related genetically than say, allopatric populations of the same morph type. So if you look at the, the yellow and morph at the top lake, it's more closely genetically related to the green morph within the lake than it is to the yellow uh, population in the neighboring lake. And that means that we can sort of consider these sympatric morphs as replicates of incipient speciation and then compare them to see if the genetic underpinnings of that differentiation is consistent. And that gets to that very fundamental question of you know, the predictability of evolution. Uh, so I was quite interested in this in um, the, my study species is Arctic char. So I work in Arctic char in Labrador, Canada. And there's many different uh, morph types of char in this region. Um, but for right now, I'm just going to talk about these three locations where we have sympatric small and big morphs. And we uh, genotyped fish from these locations using about 20,000 SNP markers, so 20,000 regions across the genome. And what we got was the following Manhattan plot. So you'll notice, like the brown trout figure I showed earlier, genome-wide, there's very strong genetic differentiation between the sympatric morphs in each of our three locations. There's only a single SNP that was found to differentiate the sympatric morphs in all three locations. Um, and this SNP is actually in a, in a very interesting gene. So this is in papillysin 2, which is associated with growth, actually. And if you knock it out in a mouse model, you get a shrunken mouse embryo. So this was pretty exciting, because it suggested that maybe this gene was repeatedly driving small size in uh, Arctic char. Um, similarly, when we look across salmonids, uh, we found that there were many genes which seemed to consistently differ between sympatric morphs in multiple salmonid species. And this is just an example of a couple of them, but there's, there's more in the paper if you're interested. Um, and so these results suggest that there is some genetic predictability to sympatric morph differentiation. But returning to our Manhattan plots, um, there's no sort of denying the fact that the vast amount of genetic differentiation between our sympatric morphs is not observed in multiple locations. And this is not an anomalous result. Many other studies have found similar things. So these are a list of studies that looked at um, sympatric morphs and uh, found the number of outlier loci differentiating between them and compared them across locations in a variety of different species. And they found the number of outlier loci um, that uh, detected, detected between sympatric morphs in at least two locations. So these are ones that show evidence of parallelism. And it's a small minority of all outlier loci detected between sympatric morphs. So on average across these 11 studies, it was about 10% of loci showed evidence of genetic parallelism. So one might be wondering, well, why is there so little genetic parallelism? Why is there no predictability to, at the genetic level, between uh, these sympatric morphs and their evolution. One of the reasons this could be, though, is because many of the studies I showed you were not looking across the entire genome of these species. They were looking using neutral microsatellite markers, or like our study, we were using 20,000 regions along the genome, but that's not, most of these genomes are quite large, about 3.2 gigabases, so um, we're missing parts of the genome. So. Uh, future studies doing whole genome sequencing will sort of be better able to answer this question. But it could just well be that there are many different, you know, roads to Rome, right? There may be many different genetic pathways that you can take as a fish to achieve the same phenotypic differentiation over and over again. But also we might be looking in the wrong places. So um, most of the studies I showed you in the previous slide, that, that list of 11, 
Uh, we're looking at parallelism at the level of the, uh, at the allele or the gene. So what I mean by that is parallelism at the level of the allele would be if it's the same, the same position in the same gene which differentiates the morphs in multiple locations. Parallelism at the gene, relatedly, would be it's the same gene that differentiates the morphs, but maybe it's a different location within the gene. It's a different uh, allele, a different mutation. Um, but there are other mechanistic levels where parallelism could occur. So for example, parallelism at the level of the paralog. So um, not these pair of logs, but paralogs within their genome, right? So paralogs are just additional copies of the same gene that can be uh, at, at different positions within the genome. So for example, um, in location one, it could be gene X, which differentiates our green and orange St. Patrick morphs. But in location two, it's a different copy of gene X somewhere else in the genome that differentiates uh, the St. Patrick morphs. And there's good reason to think that this might play a key role in the evolution of St. Patrick morphs because, of course, um, Salmonids at the base of this clade, there was, of course, this whole genome duplication. And so um, Salmonids have a lot of paralogs in their genome as a result of this. Um, but I just want to reinforce the idea that this is not unique to Salmonids. Um, many species, including ourselves, have a whole genome duplication in our evolutionary history. Um, it's just that in Salmonids, it's more recent, so it's um, a little bit easier to study. So we were looking for parallelism at the level of the paralog in our St. Patrick's small and big morphs of Arctic char, and we find a number of examples of this. So on the left is uh, the name of the gene, and on the right, for each of our three locations with the St. Patrick's small and big morphs, we have where in the genome a copy of that particular gene was found to be an outlier differentiating the sympatric morphs. So it's easier to just do an example. So proneurigulin 3 membrane bound, there's multiple copies of this gene within the genome. Uh, in our population in Rama, where we have small and big morphs, it's the copy on chromosome 17 that differentiates the morphs. Whereas in our population in Brooklyn, uh, the small and big morphs are differentiated by the copy of this gene on chromosome 25, whereas uh, our population in Esker North, the small and big morphs are differentiated by the copy of this gene on chromosome 18. So it's a different copy of this gene, which differentiates the morphs in each of our three locations, despite the fact that these locations are very close together and share a relatively recent common history. Okay, I want to drive home the point of multiple mechanistic levels, and some of which may not be uh, genetic at all, right? So we could have consistent differences in terms of um, epigenetic uh, changes. So green morphs could be highly methylated in gene X, and orange morphs are not methylated quite so much. We could have differences in terms of post-transcriptional modification, so differences in splicing of mRNA. So green morphs splice a particular gene one way, orange morphs splice it a different way. Or we could have differences in terms of gene expression. So um, gene X is overexpressed in the green morphs and not expressed as, as much in the orange morphs. And there are many other mechanistic levels. And so I just want to um, emphasize this, that we could be looking at other levels where parallelism could be occurring. Uh, and to note that these, these levels are not, they're not mutually exclusive. We could have parallelism operating on multiple levels here. And we don't really have a good understanding of the evolutionary significance of each of these mechanistic levels. There are outstanding questions like which level is most important, um, because speciation is an ongoing process, so maybe at the beginning of speciation, you know, epigenetic mechanistic levels are more important. Later in speciation, it's more genetic levels that are more important. And also, different mechanistic levels could could relate to different traits, right? So some work on this has already been done in Arctic char. Um, this work by Jacobs and Elmer in 2021 looked at sympatric morphs of Arctic char in Scotland. They had pelagic and uh, benthic morphs, and they investigated the genes that were differentially expressed between these morphs and compared them to the genes that were differentially spliced. And what they found that was that these genes tended to be separate from each other, like differentially spliced genes were not differentially expressed, and they were associated with different go terms, which means they probably had different functions. So um, differentially expressed genes might be doing different things to the phenotype than differentially spliced genes. 
Uh, and so I think future studies which sort of simultaneously look at multiple mechanistic levels like this can be really helpful for um, answering these outstanding questions. Okay, so I want to shift focus here sort of dramatically from uh, the small scale, looking at these molecular mechanisms, and zoom out uh, on a much larger temporal and spatial scale and think about um, historical allopatric events and secondary contact and how that might have influenced uh, the evolution of these sympatric morphs. So um, many Arctic species, of course, uh, have been who are subject to these sort of glaciation cycles. That can result during glaciation periods of species being separated into these allopatric populations, these refugial populations. And then in interglacial periods, like the one we're in right now, you can have secondary contact between these different lineages. And um, interestingly, we often see sympatric morphs of salmonids in these zones of secondary contact. So. Um, an example of this is uh, okay. So an example of this is uh, an Arctic char. Uh, so there's five known glacial lineages of Arctic char, and this is the contemporary distribution of them all. And you will notice that right where I study the Arctic char, there's thought to be a secondary contact event. And when we went to investigate this using mitochondrial DNA, um, we found some really interesting results. So to orient you to this figure on the right here, uh, all the sampling locations where we took samples from are noted, and then the pie charts tell you what proportion of samples had the Arctic lineage or the Atlantic lineage or the Acadian lineage in their mitochondrial DNA, uh, and that's based on color. So yellow is for Atlantic, blue is for Arctic, and green is for Acadian. And so you'll notice very obviously there's a lot of yellow and blue everywhere, and that's because we think there's been extensive introgression between these two lineages of Arctic char, despite the fact that actually they've been separated for about a million years, so that's quite interesting. And we also see evidence of um, introgression with the Akkadian lineage. So there's been a lot of hybridization in this region, and we also have many populations that have sympatric morphs. This is not just a char thing, though, so... Um, uh, Lake Whitefish colonized Canada from five different glacial lineages, and we often see uh, populations of Lake Whitefish with sympatric morphs uh, in these secondary contact zones. So um, I've, been, I've been thinking about how uh, the secondary contact might have influenced contemporary sympatric morph differentiation, and I've come up with four sort of scenarios as to how this might happen. Um, so imagine you have two you know, lineages that have been separated for a million years, they come back into secondary contact. How could this influence contemporary structure of sympatric morphs? Well, it could be that um, one lineage founds one morph, and the other lineage founds the other morph, and there's no introgression between these lineages. Um, and so the morph A, our green morph, is, descends entirely from lineage one. Morph B, the orange morph, descends entirely from lineage two. Um, this is very rare in salmonids. There's not a lot of examples of this. So, for example, um, in uh, our sympatric small and big morphs in uh, Labrador, Canada, we see that typically within a lake, you'll have fixation of a single glacial lineage. So you'll have um, all the fish have the Atlantic lineage haplotype, or they all have the Arctic lineage haplotype, or occasionally both morphs will have both um, haplotypes present within uh, those groups. And so what this suggests is that it's not like the small morph was always founded by the Arctic lineage and the big morph was always founded by the Atlantic lineage. Probably what happened was there was intergression between these two lineages prior to sympatric morphs evolved. However, we do see an example of where different lineages found different morphs uh, in Corrigonus clupeiformis, so lake whitefish. Uh, particularly in this one population on the East Coast called Cliff Lake, we can see that the dwarf morph um, mitochondrially is, is entirely Acadian lineage, while, whereas the normal morph is entirely Atlantic lineage. And when we look at the nuclear DNA, we can see very, very strong genetic differentiation between these two morphs, which suggests that probably they were founded by different glacial lineages and there's been no sort of crosstalk since then. Alternatively, it could be that there may, 
there may well have been introgression between these lineages, but not in the regions of the genome that are actually responsible for the phenotypic differences between the morphs. So um, while there's, uh, there's been introgression through much of the genome, these are the purple bits of the chromosomes, um, you know, morph A here, the green morph, gets all of its important genetic material that makes it a green morph from lineage one, and vice versa for um, morph B from lineage two. Okay, a slightly different scenario is that there's total introgression between the two lineages, and then uh, all of the alleles which actually separate the morphs come from one lineage. Um, and this is a lineage which is sort of predisposed to radiation. And I've been wondering if this might be the case in Arctic char, because uh, we know in char that two lineages, the Atlantic and the Siberian, tend to be highly radiative. So there's many of examples within these two lineages of these sympatric morphs that are strongly genetically and phenotypically differentiated from each other. Um, we do see phenotypically differentiated sympatric morphs in the Arctic lineage, but these don't tend to have genetic differences between them. And so I've been wondering if maybe the genetic differences we see between our sympatric morphs in the Labrador, that allelic variation might be coming from uh, the Atlantic lineage. But it's just, it's just a, a guess at this point. Okay, so the final scenario is where you have um, sort of this combinatorial speciation approach where you have lineages introgressing and this allows for, because you've got all this new novel genetic material, this allows for new combinations of genes and alleles and that allows for sort of new forms to evolve. It's to this radiation of different forms and novel combinations of alleles from very different lineages. And uh, this type of combinatorial speciation has been well described in this paper by Mark Sedal, 2019, and they suggested that it's this uh, phenomena that is driving the radiation in African rift lake cichlids. Um, similarly, it's been suggested that uh, in Switzerland, where there's been secondary contact between two glacial lineages of Corrigonus lavaretus, that the radiation of phenotypes we see in, in th these particular lakes in Switzerland have been caused by this phenomena. Um, so the take home from, from this section is that the, the relative importance of each of these scenarios is um, currently unknown. We don't know which is more important or which is more likely or which evolutionary processes would select for one scenario over another. Um, but understanding this is critical for salmonids but also for many other species because uh, as you can see from this figure, this is for uh, many marine species. You can see the red is the distribution of known glacial refugia, and then green are the points of secondary contact. And so there's lots of points of secondary contact because this is a, not a rare phenomenon. It happens in many different uh, species. Uh, and I think salmonids are going to be a really wonderful model for investigating this in future because we actually know a lot about the current distributions of the glacial lineages within Zalmanids because there's been a ton of work done on this using mitochondrial DNA for the last 20 years or so. Okay, so um, I hope at this point I've hopefully convinced you that Salmonids are really, and particularly sympatric morphs within Salmonids, are really great models for understanding evolution. First of all, because the sympatric morphs have evolved recently, meaning that we can sort of directly observe the genes that are driving their morph differentiation. Um, and these sympatric morphs have also evolved repeatedly and relatively independently, um, meaning that they provide these sort of wonderful natural replicates um, of speciation that we can then compare um, to sort of address these fundamental questions of the predictability of evolution. Of course, salmonids have recently been subject to a whole genome duplication, and so uh, they're a wonderful model for studying the effects of that. And they've also been subject to recent allopatry and secondary contact, so they're wonderful models for studying this as well. And so the bottom line is that um, I think sympatric salmonid morphs have um, a, a lot of promise for teaching us a lot about fundamental evolutionary processes in the future. And I think the insights we gain about evolution from studying these sympatric salmonid morphs is going to help us preserve not only the economic, cultural, and ecological value of salmonids, but of species across the tree of life. 
And so with that, uh, there's many, many people to thank for help with this work. Everyone who helped with the field work and the lab work, our funding sources. Um, I want to thank my supervisor, Dana Rizante, and I want to thank uh, the Nanatsivik <coughs> government in Labrador for allowing us to collect Arctic char from their lands. And finally, I, I really want to thank um, Fish Base and the Swedish Museum of Natural History and Bo, Andrea, and Michael for um, organizing this and inviting me to chat with you today and also all of you for your attention. So thanks very much. <clears throat> thank you very much, Sara. I think we will hear more from, from you in the future. This was extremely interesting. There are time for questions, so please go ahead. Anyone? There will be lunch later on, so no, no worry. Thank you very much. It, this is area is very new for me, so I, I'm not. Bad, but uh, connecting this to the previous lecture about opening up. A dam system that had been closed for a hundred years, comparing to your um, talk about uh, uh, closing the system since the Ice Age and uh, finding new uh, morphological combinations, uh, meeting of fishes that never met before, or, uh, creating new. Uh, could 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 it be something that could happen in when you open up a dam like we heard like this? Uh, what, what would be uh, your input to check on the, the genes of the new fishes? Because we heard that the, the, the fish that were close down the dam, the, the trouts, they were going down to the sea again. And would, would it be like they meet new ones? Yeah, for sure. I mean, George is probably more an expert in this than I am. Um, but for sure, there's an opportunity for, um, if once you have local adaptation, uh, you know, if you're upstream of a dam and then you're suddenly exposed to populations that were downstream of a dam, um, you have this, you'll have this new mixing of, of genetic material which could facilitate new phenotypes potentially or um, rescue phenotypes, like you could see the re-emergence of, um, uh, well, as George was saying, with the, the, the spring run, uh, salmon were, were renewed from that input from the the salmon above the Elwha uh, River Dam. So, yeah, absolutely. Microallopatry on such a small scale, uh, even over like a couple of generations, can because populations which are um, separated like that, they accumulate a lot of genetic distinctiveness due to genetic drift. And so, I, yeah, as you said, even on a couple of generations, you can accumulate strong genetic differences, and then you know, if those barriers are removed, that can have consequences like the four scenarios that I sort of outlined. But of course, the genetic, the amount of genetic differentiation will depend upon how much time has elapsed between the separation between those populations. Yeah. Uh, because I'm the fish farmer and... Uh, ah, okay. ...they have the hatcheries there in this uh, river also, and then uh, you, uh, you try to get eggs that are uh, fitting to your, uh, your, your farming. Yep. And then, of course, these eggs are also uh, getting out in the wild. Yep. So, so, and then if you imported eggs, uh, then you will have mixing this up. And uh, uh, is it any input you will give on that? What do you think about? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, I mean, this is a real issue for um, if you're stocking fish as well. Like, you want to make sure that um, you're stocking with fish that are not... are. Like, if there's locally adapted fish in an area, you don't want to be stocking with something that's totally genetically different from another different lineage or something. And um, so we need to be sort of th thinking a lot more, I think, in terms of stocking uh, which glacial lineages we're going to be using to stock. But even on a more sort of smaller time frame, you want to make sure that uh, populations that are similar to each other are being combined and you're not having necessarily very, because you can have issues of swamping, as you mentioned with the um, fish farming, you don't want to have, uh, 
For example, if you have aquaculture populations which are selected for a particular environment, they may be maladapted to the wild environment, and so you don't necessarily want that hybridization, even though that would result in potentially novel genetic combinations, but they may not actually be very beneficial. So, um, but I mean, you make a great point, though, that you need to consider the, the evolutionary history of the things that are coming into secondary contact, and that was sort of trying what I was trying to get to with uh, those scenarios. Yeah, thanks. Please feel free if there are any other questions. Well, otherwise, I think I will ask one. Uh, as you seem to be into Salvelinus, Arctic chars, and these sympatric forms and species, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, do you know, are there any recent data at this level, genomic level almost, for this Lake El Gugutkin in Siberia with this very strange deep water uh, form? And have you come through that? Uh, have you found anything there? Yes, this is the, the Russian populations. There's all kinds of really interesting yeah, yeah, work yeah. coming out. Um, there seem to be, I think, I can't remember if it's Dolly Varden or Arctic Char, but there's like eight or nine different sympatric mm -hmm. morphs. I think, as far as I'm aware, last time I checked the literature, the, the most number of um, sympatric morphs in Arctic char that are known to be genetically differentiated mm -hmm. from each other was actually, um, it's a population in southern Greenland, actually, which has a, there's an anadromous population and then five resident, okay. which are um, genetically differentiated. But uh, I think, yeah, the Russian populations, there's, because there's such large, big lakes in that region, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think there's a real opportunity to study speciation there, yeah. been looked at genomically as okay. far as I know, I mean with expression mm. or whatever there, but it does come out in the middle of the phylogeny, so it does seem like a rapidly evolved thing and yeah, not okay. some primitive, that's the one thing. But to that lake in, in, in um, is it Greenland or what about Iceland? So there's another lake in Iceland where they have the five forms. And we had a colleague uh, in Graz that's mm. now I think he's in Sweden now, if I'm not mistaken, who did a lot of gene expression work in that lake with the five forms. And he found um, the, the, the morphology of the mouths of these forms um, already differentiating before the first time they fed. So this was a really strong evidence that it was already uh, programmed to some extent in the, in the, in the genomics of the, of the expression wise. So the morphology of these benthic and pelagic were already forming before the first time they fed, because a lot of people thought it was a very, very plastic thing that mm -hmm. maybe was getting driven after they start feeding. So this was kind of interesting, so. Okay, yeah. uh, that was Ting or? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, you make a very good point. So um, in char, at least, it used to be thought that all of the diversity we see within the species is plasticity, um, and it's only recently uh, that we've sort of started to accumulate more genetic information, and we're seeing that there really is a strong genetic differentiation between some of these morphs. So it's plasticity is obviously part of the is part of the evolution of these these morphs, but uh, genetics are are really playing a role as well. Yeah. Okay, now we have a question uh, up in the middle. Do you have a strong voice or do you need the microphone? Yeah, good question. Um, so, yeah. yeah, yeah. What's your what's your species definition? Okay. So, I mean, I like to think of it as um, speciation is a continuum. So you can have, you know, uh, and and so so too is morph differentiation. And I think these morphs are sort of um, earlier on in the speciation continuum. Um, but but some of these morphs show like very strong reproductive isolation. And you, you could see from the Manhattan plots, like the genome wide FST, if it's over like 0.2, that's bigger than allopatric populations. It's equivalent to populations sometimes on opposite sides of the world, right? So um, maybe not quite that high, but it's, it's indicative that these are all the things that are associated with speciation, right? Is the phenotypic differentiation and the, the reproductive isolation. And so I would say that 
yeah, people, I've had this question a lot, is are they really different species? Uh, and I, I think you can argue it sort of both ways, but I, I think <laughs> the observation of reproductive isolation and the genetic differentiation is, is sort of what's, what's critical here. So that's a hand wave you say of, I'm not going to answer your question, <laughs> so. Okay, I think we shouldn't get into the depth of the species question because then <laughs> we will have no lunch. It's, uh, it's complicated with this research, really. So uh, thank you very much. This was very interesting. Thank I you. Thought. Cheers.